This is Michael Knowles on the left and Christopher Hitchens on the right. Now, Michael Knowles did this video titled Michael Knowles debunks Christopher Hitchens viral moments. Hitchens is a famous atheist. Of course, he died, um, at, what, 10 years ago or so of cancer, I believe. And Michael Knowles is a Daily Wire host and is about as far right as it gets. He hates trans people. He hates gay people. He hates everything that Christopher Hitchens did not hate, by and large. Although Christopher Hitchens was a little bit more right-leaning as far as famous atheists go. But I wanted to give this a listen because Michael Knowles says some absolutely psychotic stuff in it. If you're unfamiliar with Michael Knowles, let me just give you one quick basic video this took place uh, i think last year should give you a little context for what type of person he is this is at cpac this took place um uh, march 4th 2023 false then for the good of society and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely the whole preposterous ideology at so this is um, genocidal language he's using here. Every level. About as disturbing as it gets, honestly, to hear people say things like that. It doesn't normally end well when people start saying that kind of thing. So let's give this a listen. Let, now you know Michael knows. Let's see what he has to say here about Christopher Hitchens. Anyone who doesn't know this doesn't know anything about it. Is it not written that I come not to bring a peace but a sword? Surely it is. I'm saying there are specific biblical scriptural injunctions to do evil. I'll give you all the miracles and you'll still be left exactly where you are now, holding an empty sack. You know, I was an atheist for 10 years and one of the reasons that I was an atheist is the very unfortunate timing that I was a 13 year old boy. Okay, I don't think believe for a second that he was an atheist. I feel like being an atheist is kind of like a one way street. Like once you see fundamentalist extremist Christianity, which is what this guy is from, fundamentalist extremist Christianity, once you see it for the ridiculous thing that it really is, it's a one-way street. You don't go back on that. I don't believe that this guy was an atheist. I, maybe he believes that he was, but I'm sorry, man. I, I'm just not convinced. When Christopher Hitchens got really, really popular for being an atheist, and I remember at the time, there were all those new atheists, the four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse. Yeah, I remember the four horsemen when that happened. That was uh, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris. And they went on a four horsemen tour. Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens. And those first three were not all that interesting, at least not to a 13-year-old boy. No, Daniel Dennett was actually, when I was in college and taking my psychology classes, I was surprised to find studies cited that were written by and performed by Daniel Dennett. This dude was extremely influential in the field of psychology. He's not a nobody, uh, nobody by any stretch of the imagination. But okay, go on. And those first three were not all that interesting, at least not to a 13-year-old boy. But, but Chris Hitchens really was, he was so clever, he seemed so witty, he was so drunken and sweaty and British. He just seemed really, really great at the time. And I can't even imagine how many poor souls he has led away from God and to eternal perdition. Really sad. Now I find I go back and I read a Hitchens essay or I look at a Hitchens video and it just doesn't hit the same. And so Hitchens still has some funny bits. He has bits about how women aren't funny, and he's got some great bits on scotch and tea and things like that. Wait, I okay, first of all, I don't remember this bit about women not being funny from Hitchens. Like I said, he's a little bit right-leaning, so I guess I wouldn't be surprised to find out that he had a bit on that. But why is that the thing that this dude picked out as like the pinnacle of Christopher Hitchens um, career or whatever? Stuff on God, in retrospect, seems like weak sauce. So the producers have picked the creme de la creme of Christopher Hitchens atheist videos. I have not seen these videos, or at the very least, I haven't seen them in probably 20 years. And we're going to take a look back decades after 
this man helped lead me down the dark road. Take it away. Down the dark road, okay. If you meet someone in the street who you yesterday saw executed, you can say either that an extraordinary miracle has occurred or that you are under a very grave misapprehension. And David Hume's logic on this, I think, is quite irrefutable. He says, what is more likely, that the laws of nature have been suspended in your favor and in a way that you approve, or that you've made a mistake, especially if you didn't see it yourself and you're hearing it from someone who says that they did. After all, Laz not Not only that especially if you're hearing it from somebody who says that they did 50 years later the person on their deathbed you know uh 50 years after the chain of events took place is claiming that they saw this thing or whatever like come on really quick interjection i won't take long i just wanted to tell you guys youtube's algorithm operates off of a few factors watch time whether or not you subscribe and whether or not you like something. So if you really want to help my channel, I would appreciate it if you guys watch the video to the end. If you don't watch it to the end, just watch a little bit longer than you would have otherwise. I would appreciate that very much. All right, let's get back to the video. Lazarus was raised, never said a word about it. The daughter of Jairus was raised, didn't say a thing about what she'd been through. And the Gospels tell us that at the time of the crucifixion, all the graves in Jerusalem opened and their occupants wandered around the streets to greet. So it seems the resurrection was a, a, a something of a banality at the time. And, and on top of that, there were historians in the area, like Josephus, famously a historian of the era. And he didn't record a damn thing about zombies getting up and walking around the, uh, you know, the, the city or whatever. He didn't say a word about it. How about that? He wrote about all kinds of things. In fact, he even mentioned Jesus a couple times. I think five times, some of which were forgeries. But anyways, he mentioned Jesus a couple times is the point. And somehow it just s escaped his memory. He just forgot to write down the fact that people were being raised from the dead on the regular. Really? Okay, go on. I'm with you. So it seems the resurrection was a, a, a something of a banality at the time. Not all, <laughs> not all of those people clearly were divinely uh, conceived. I'll give you all the miracles, and you'll still be left exactly where you are now, holding an empty sack. Christopher Hitchens is saying, well, what's more likely, that you, the individual, were deceived, or that the laws of nature were suspended? Absolutely agreed, especially considering the fact that, like, nobody witnessed anything. The, none of this stuff is coming from first-hand accounts of anything at all this is all just like assumption built on hearsay built on the game of telephone ultimately you know but when we're talking about the resurrection we're not talking about you individually being deceived we're talking about 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection there were not 500 eyewitnesses to the in uh, I'm sorry insurrection uh to the resurrection there weren't 500 what are you talking about where are you getting this information from this is nonsense. We're talking about all of the apostles being deceived. Okay, well, here's one of my bigger problems with what he's saying right now. Yeah, okay, let me just lay this down for the Christians in the audience. Let me just tell you this, okay? They're about to talk about the resurrection and Jesus being the son of God and everything else. A lot. I, I have a canonical idea in my head of what the Bible really means in various verses and my canonical understanding is based on historical evidence and outside sources and things like that now you can under you can have a historical understanding of the bible and still be christian that's totally fine that's possible there are a lot of them out there i mean a real historical like a, a scholarly understanding of the books of the bible and everything else and still be Christian. That's perfectly okay. But if you do have a scholarly, historical understanding of Christianity, you're going to have to give a few things up because those things are absolutely not supported and ridiculous. You want to think that Jesus came here to be the Messiah or whatever? Fine. You can do that if you would like, but you cannot claim that there was original sin that was not originally part of the bible you know with adam and eve for example you cannot claim that jesus came here to die for your sins that was not part of jesus plan originally it was written in after the fact you can't claim that he uh, you know atoned for your sins or whatever other thing you can't claim that he died and was like resurrected or any of that stuff none of that is a historical 
part of it can't be historically established what you can establish historically is that there was probably a real guy named jesus and he believed himself to be the messiah maybe the guy that was going to like reunite the entire region in a kingdom under his kingship that was what the original expectation and plan was for the messiah he was gonna it means like anointed one the plan was that the messiah whoever it happened to be was going to come along and reunite the entire region as their king under god's leadership that was the expectation now jesus didn't do that he didn't come along and take control political control of the area the region and start uh, uniting everything and fighting wars and stuff to retake the area. That didn't happen. He died first. And his people were, like, confused as hell about this. They're like, how could he die? That doesn't make any sense. He needed to take political control and bring about, like, a, a, a time of prosperity and peace where we are all led under the kingship of God's guy or whatever. That was the expectation. And when he died, they said... Uh, okay. Well, this is part of the plan. Just stick it out and see what happens next. This is all part of the plan. So even Jesus did not believe himself to be God. None of the people around at the time believed Jesus to be God. No one claimed to have witnessed the resurrection who actually witnessed the resurrection. So Peter, Paul, and Mary, and all of those other people, I'm sorry, not Paul, Peter, Mary, and, you know, any disciples around Jesus, none of them claimed to see it. After the fact, 50 years later, people who had never met Jesus claimed that those people claimed to have witnessed a resurrection. Again, the resurrection is not a necessary piece of the puzzle here. You can be Christian without a resurrection. It's just going to be a a more historically accurate version of Christianity, one where Jesus is on his way to usher in God's kingdom. It has nothing to do with, like, atoning sins or whatever. That was added later. Anyway, I'm sorry for that long explanation. I just felt I needed to get that out. All this stuff about, like, 500 people witnessing God's resurrect. No. What is this painting even? This is absurd. This isn't, like, biblical... Uh, this isn't biblically accurate in any way you think that it was a uh, just like a coffin it the bible says it was a tomb with a giant rock in front of it you think the dude just stood up and walked out and there were guards that were thrown aside no no to all of that michael knowles is an absurd human being without all of this nonsense being in the mix it just blows me away man talking about all of the apostles being deceived People after the fact claimed that the apostles claimed to see Jesus. Just want to put that on record. These Gospels were written within three or four decades of the resurrection. That would be like me right now writing about Tupac Shakur. And I say, actually, Tupac rose from the dead. Well, if I said that, and if that story was spreading around, people would contradict me if it didn't really happen. And you see the new. Well, you think Christianity wasn't contradicted? Are you kidding me? First of all, and second, um, okay, Mark was written in 70 C, uh, CE, which is about, I believe it was 70, which is pretty much the earliest gospel that we have our, that we got our hands on. And the others were based on Mark and John was written in the year 100, maybe 110, somewhere in that vicinity. So we'll say 70 CE. So it was about 40 years later. We'll say that it was about 40 years after Jesus died. Sure. So this is 2023. I guess it would be like 1983. So Tupac Shakur died in 1990-something, didn't he? Yeah, he died in 96. So no, you, you still got 15 years to go. That's inaccurate. I mean, it's a little thing, but you can see how he's just twisting it just a little bit, right? He's stretching it just a little, trying to make it slightly more plausible and ease it just that much more. This is how propaganda works. This is propaganda. New Testament accounts. It's referring to people who would have still been alive and whose relatives would have still been alive at the time those gospel accounts were circulating. Maybe, sure, I suppose. 
Some of them were written by people who were not there to see it, who didn't witness it, who didn't know anybody who witnessed it. A lot of this stuff was written by those types of people. A lot of this stuff is completely fabricated out of the ether and inaccurate. I mean, it contradictory to each other. So I'm sorry, man. I'm just like, I'm not buying it. I need a little bit more than that. And you have four accounts, all of which basically agree with one another. And where they would seem to disagree on certain details, they do so in the way that newspapers disagree about news events. No, that's completely false. They disagree in glaring ways. They disagree in ways that they simply should not disagree with. Like, it makes no sense for the Gospels to disagree on certain things. And certain Gospel writers wrote stories into their Gospels that we know for a fact simply did not happen. For example, that story about Jesus saying he who's without sin should cast the first stone about the adulteress or whatever, that never happened. That's fake. We know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's a ton of stuff in here that's false. Again, if you take a historical view of the Bible, you don't have to walk away from Christianity. There are a lot of scholars of that day that are still Christian right now. But don't lie to, like, set up your belief system. That's just absurd and embarrassing. In fact, the, the fact that they seem to disagree about certain details or, or seem to approach events from different vantage points actually would be a mark in their favor. Because if they were well, it would be if we thought maybe they weren't copying off of each other, but we know for a fact that they all copied off of each other. They're all exactly completely in lockstep on vantage point. And they were. They were in exact lockstep in large part. The, the Gospels were. There were large swaths, like paragraphs that were exact direct copies word for word every single line you would say oh this was just contrived the fact that this was all circulated oh wh wait I is he saying that if we find examples of gospels exactly copying each other it would he would accept that it was all contrived because i can provide those examples if that's what he's looking for there is for instance a 27 word string of verbatim agreement between matthew and luke which you can see here on screen. This appears in a speech given by Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 and Luke chapter 10. Here the synoptics present Jesus' teaching with the exact same words in the exact same order. There's a 64-word passage in the preaching of John the Baptist where Matthew and Luke differ by only three or four words. And there are dozens of other examples like this. These kind of agreements between the synoptics are even more remarkable when we remember that Jesus taught in Aramaic not Greek. It is simply not plausible that two authors working independently would translate Jesus' Aramaic into Greek in precisely the same way. Here, Matthew and Mark describe Judas' actions in the very same language. To summarize, the verbatim agreement between the Synoptic Gospels indicates that the Gospel writers were copying from each other. When the later Gospel writers, whichever ones they were, began to compose their own Gospel, they had a copy of the earlier Synoptic Gospel in front of them. In writing their own Gospels then, they copied extensively out of their literary predecessor. The Gospels most definitely and absolutely copied each other. It's believed that Mark was probably, it, Mark was copying from a source and Luke and Matthew copied from a combination of Mark and another shared source between them. Yeah, the book of John is its own beast that doesn't really fit in with the, the others. Well, that's why the others are called synoptic gospels. They're all part of one grouping, but John is completely different from everything else. It, it's more made up. It's fabricated like a lot, like large swaths of John is fabricated. And the writer of John who came along in, you know, the year 100 to 110, 80 years after Jesus died, tried to establish the idea that Jesus was God when even Jesus did not believe that. It's a bastardization of the understanding. You would say, oh, this was just contrived. The fact that this was all circulated. The fact that we see this in non-Christian sources. We don't. We see what? Are you talking about what? Jesus' miracles? The zombies coming up out of the ground, walking into Jerusalem? No, we don't. We don't see this in non-Christian sources at all. None of this. We see 
that there was a guy named Jesus in non-Christian sources. The fact that this event changed the entire world and has withstood debunking for 2,000 years. Has it? Has it withstood debunking for 2,000 years? Really? No, there are a billion examples of things that, you know, modern day Christians get simply wrong. Simply glaringly wrong over and over again. Like we're listening to this dude tell us that like Jesus, what you, you know, the resurrection was witnessed by 500 people. Like what? That's just completely made up. All this stuff is made up. Again, I personally believe, not everybody does, but I think Jesus is probably a real guy. Did he perform all those miracles? I doubt it to the bottom of my heart. And as a matter of fact, the reason I doubt it is because we have historians in the area at the time who didn't, who reported on Jesus, but didn't report on those miracles that he supposedly performed. It's just a joke, man. And the best that Christopher Hitchens can offer is some stupid line from David Hume. Weak sauce. What's the next one? I never said that I attacked bad behavior that was undertaken or embarked upon in the name of, as you put it. Dude, I really wish that they would not, like, do cuts and jumps in between, like, videos that they're playing. I, I try to never do that. I try to play the entire thing. If I insert commentary in the middle of it, I step back one sentence so that you can see the continuity of the thing being said. I don't trust these people at all. I'm, I'm talking um, Michael Knowles and uh, the Daily Wire and stuff. I don't trust them at all. I certainly don't trust them to accurately represent what was being said by Christopher Hitchens. And, and I absolutely don't trust them to not cut things out. I never said that I attacked bad behavior that was undertaken or embarked upon in the name of, as you put it, religion. I do insist that this kind of bad behavior is innate in religion, is part of religion itself. It's not an abuse of it or something undertaken in the name of. It's a direct consequence of the willingness to believe in the supernatural and the willingness to believe in a supernatural dictatorship in particular. Is it not written that I come not to bring a peace but a sword? Surely it is. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Hitchens is saying something that I don't really agree with here exactly. Hitchens is saying... The Bible has inherently horrific and violent things in it. Thus, you can expect horrific and violent things or behaviors to come out of the followers. I simply disagree. I mean, there are violent things in the Bible, of course, but there are also endorsements of peace and love and happiness and not hating anybody for anything. And it, it, a lot of that stuff comes from Jesus. So I, I kind of reject the idea that anybody that reads the Bible is going to come out an extremist. Not necessarily. I mean, you can pick out your moral system, the one that you want to follow from the Bible, and it's just as accurate as anybody else's because the Bible endorses every position. Every moral position can be found there believe in a supernatural dictatorship in particular. Is it not written that I come not to bring a peace but a sword? Surely it is. Um, is it not written that those who won't follow me shall be departed, must depart and be cast into everlasting fire? Not a very gentle or pacific remark. Is it not said? No, not really. Um, I mean, that's complicated. The hellfire thing. It's not exactly like that, but okay. I, I, like I said, there are some grotesque parts of the Bible, absolutely and without doubt. Um, it's just like, you, you, it's what you pick and choose, pretty much. You can't do this without picking and choosing. That if you don't give up your family, if you don't give up thrift, if you don't give up everyone who loves you and everything you love to sacrifice yourself for me, you're not worthy. These are strongly coercive and implicitly authoritarian or even totalitarian statements. Oh, my goodness gracious. I, you know, it's funny going back to these now because I, I still see how they appeal to a 13-year-old. I mean, that's kind of a low blow. you saying that, like, only 13-year-olds would appreciate what's being said right now. I mean, I kind of disagree with some of what Hitchens said generally because he was saying the Bible is inherently violent and will inherently produce violent um, ideology, violent behavior in its followers. I, I don't agree with that necessarily, but... To say that, like, it only appeals to a 13-year-old, like, come on, man. For all of his British charm, he talks like an edgy 13-year-old online. I mean, this is, not, this is not sophisticated stuff at all. By the end, he's, he's 
really misparaphrasing the gospel accounts. Misparaphrase? Oh, is he? How? Jesus said, I come to bring not peace but a sword, didn't he? I'm not quite sure how that's misparaphrasing the gospels. I mean, it it's explicitly says that. I'm not sure what this dude's talking about, honestly. Uh, Christ doesn't tell you that you have to <laughs> abandon your family in order to follow him, though you should place him and God. Wait, well, Christ does say that. I mean, it's it's complicated, of course, but he does say that. I mean, so basically what's happening here, like I said, you have to pick and choose what you want to believe. That's just what it is. You have to pick and choose what you believe in the Bible because it's such a broad book written by so many different people over so many different centuries. There are people with all kinds of moral beliefs and varying levels of wealth, uh, varying levels of political power and fame and influence and everything else. There are people of all types that wrote the Bible, and naturally you're going to have a billion different moral opinions on different things. Of course. Is anybody like surprised by that at all? And what we're seeing here, fascinatingly, is Michael Knowles shooting down Christopher Hitchens's interpretation, when in reality, Hitchens is interpreting the Bible how a lot of fundamentalists interpret it. Again, it's not my canon interpretation personally, but it's in there. I mean, how does Knowles deny that it's there in the first place? Everything follows from that. And then he says, Christianity is not a pacifist religion. No, it's not a pacifist religion. That's true. But it's not a, a, not a call to violence. And he says it's a, a super... Mm, well, it is actually in, in many ways. Pacifist religion. That's true. But it's not a, a, not a call to violence. And he says it's a, a supernatural dictatorship. And this gets back to something you said in the previous video, too. Yeah, God is viewed as the dictator. Absolutely. It's an authoritarian dictatorship. That's, that's factual. It's set up as a theocracy where God is the leader. It says, can you imagine that how insane it would be that the laws of nature could be suspended in, in the course of miracles? You say, well, the natural has to be based on a foundation of the supernatural. This, this is necessary. The fact that we can speak, the fact that we're communicating ideas at all, which I can't touch, I can't smell them, I can't see them, but nevertheless they exist. The fact that mathematics exists, the fact that loves and dreams and hopes and desires and any in intelligible thing at all exists shows you that there is a metaphysical layer to reality. No, it shows you that things can, there are tangible things and there are intangible things. Things that you can touch and things you can't, like ideas. The fact that ideas exist does not mean that God is real as an idea. It doesn't mean those ideas are real, okay? I have an idea that there's a pink dragon in my living room that is invisible, that nobody can see except for me, and if you don't believe me, then you're going to burn in a fire for the rest of eternity. That's my claim, okay? Now, as an idea, that's real, period. That's what Michael Knowles is saying. I don't give a shit what reason you have for believing it's not. It is. That's simply not how reality works, man. I'm sorry. Now, again, if you want to believe in this stuff, that's perfectly fine with me. But don't misrepresent it and make things up and act like people are dummies when they point out how you're completely incorrect about, like, everything that you've just said. Reality, and it's more more fundamental than the physical layer. Really shallow stuff. Fit, fit for a 13-year-old. Next one. Some of your most strongly stated... Are I love how his argument is, yeah, really shallow stuff. Fit for a 13-year-old. That's as far as the analysis goes. Like, he doesn't get any deeper than that. Some of your most strongly stated arguments are that violence, death, destruction, uh... The motivation being religion uh, discredit those who would uh, promote a belief in God. However, I think there's an imbalance there in that the nuclear bomb was created by physicists and is the, the most demonstrable violence perpetrated on mankind. So I, I wonder how you respond to that. 
Well, physics. No, I'm not sure what I understand. Is he saying that like God, Christopher Hitchens accuses God of being terribly violent, which he is, but humans are more violent? Is that? I I, I think that's what he's saying, right? This isn't an ideology. Physics is. Sorry, let me, let me step back here. Demonstrable violence perpetrated on mankind. So I I wonder how you respond to that. Well, physics isn't an ideology. Physics isn't a belief system. It's a oh, here we go. You see Michael Knowles smiling like a... You, uh, I don't insult people. I'm not that guy. You can see Michael Knowles smiling because he thinks he's, he's got one over. Physics is not an ideology or a belief system. It is a factual system that we can use and verify. Michael Knowles, I, I know what he's about to say. If he says what I... What I'm very confident he's about to say, if he says that, he doesn't know the difference between fact and belief. I mean, I already recognize that he doesn't know that difference, but I'm sure he's he's about to lay it out for us. So it's a science. Well, that I think that would be subjective. I mean, you could. I mean Facts aren't subjective. Facts are not subjective. OK, you can come to true conclusions and and understandings about things that are not subjective. What a ridiculous, honestly, what a ridiculous thing to say. Are we really here right now in, in history where people claim that facts of the universe are subjective? That the fact that hydrogen has an atomic number of one because it has a single proton is subjective? Are we here right now? Is that where we're at? This isn't an ideology. Physics isn't a belief system. It's a, it's a science. Well, that, I think that would be subjective. I mean, you could, I mean, any more than uh, it, the Marie Curie uh, discovering radium makes her practice uh, morally different. I mean, it, it's not comparing like with like. What I'm talking about are specific religious injunctions to do evil, to mutilate the genitalia of children, for example. To so take the pastor, Douglas Wilson, um, who uh, Dr. Craig was just mentioning, with whom I crossed swords several times. This I think that's William Lane Craig is who he's referring to. I could be wrong. Here recently in Dallas. I happened to be mentioning to him about the commandment to exterminate the Amalekites in one of our debates. And he said that commandment is still valid. Yeah, this is an example of God ordering genocide. He commanded his people to commit genocide against the Amalekites. You ever wonder who the Amalekites are? If you do, that's because... They were genocided by God's people. That is just evil, straight up wrong, okay? I don't care what justification you use to square that circle for yourself, but it's just wrong. In one of our debates, he said that commandment is still valid. If there were any Amalekites, it would be his job to make sure that they were all put to the sword. Holy Christ, dude. If there were Amalekites, it would be William Lane Craig's job to kill them that's insane and, there, or, and some of some of the virgins left over for slavery purposes better imagined perhaps than than described i think this is a very serious problem i'm not taking refuge in the commonplace that uh, sometimes people religious people behave badly uh, that, that would discredit religion that, that would be a very soft option i'm saying there are specific biblical scriptural injunctions to do evil when we talk about human action we're talking about political action, the decision to create a bomb, the, the decision to drop that bomb, the decision to talk to somebody about dropping the bomb. That, that would be a political action that involves society. But at a higher level, what that involves is applied morality. Applied morality at a higher level? Okay, hang on. Let me just step back, listen again. Try to, I really want to understand what he's getting at here. When we talk about human action, we're talking about political action, the decision to create a bomb. The, the decision to drop that bomb, the decision to talk to somebody about dropping the bomb. That, that would be a political action that involves society. I mean, I guess it's just an action. At a higher level, what that involves is applied morality. So before you make that decision, you have to know something about applied morality. How do we come to those decisions, and what does our morality say about those decisions? Above applied morality, you have morality broadly, more abstract morality. Above that, you have anthropology. What is man? Dude, I, I don't know what this guy is talking about, how it applies to anything, or if any of this is true. Like, this all sounds like he just made it up off the top of his head. 
above morality you have anthropology what okay what is the nature of man such that we can even make these kinds of moral decisions and come to these moral conclusions and engage in these political actions i thought that was just philosophy all right above anthropology of epistemology how can we know anything at all know anything about human beings but know anything about anything sure i suppose there's ep epistemology the study of knowing the study of knowledge is what it means epistemology how do we know what we know how do we know and then beyond epistemology you have the question of theology um no that theology is not above epistemology epistemology is all encompassing they say uh, this is him laying out something called a presuppositionalist argument if you're unfamiliar with this the idea is that God and theology and everything else is above everything. So you start out with the presupposition. You presuppose that God is real. And everything that follows is everything that follows from there. That's it. Like, you don't need any more heavy lifting or thinking or processing or philosophy to come to any conclusions about God beyond that. You just have to understand God is real, and he created the laws of logic, and that's just what it is. Now, understanding that, you can build... Oh, and it has to be the Christian God, of course. Understanding that, you have to build everything out about your worldview beyond that point. That's the presuppositionalist position. Now, what he's saying, he kind of reversed the order to be one that's not bottom-up but top-down where theology is above everything else rather than presupposing things before anything else is concluded, but it's effectively the same thing. What is reality? What is? Christopher Hitchens stops at like the first circle, as do all of these people. Well, that's just science. Okay, well, what's behind the science? Yeah, this is all just presuppositionalism. Here's the problem with presuppers. I can presuppose that there is a pink dragon in my living room just as easily as you can presuppose that there's a you know that there's the christian god who sent his son to earth to die for your sins and blah, 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 blah. you can presuppose that i can presuppose my own thing and my claim is that my pink dragon is the one that makes science work properly without ever failing see you can presuppose i can presuppose and ultimately it means nothing it doesn't get us anywhere it does not get us to true conclusions about anything at all. If you want to arrive at true conclusions, you are going to have to do the, the heavy lifting without those presuppositions. What, what are the premises that go into that? They don't want to acknowledge that. They say, no, religion is all bad. Religion is a habit of virtue that renders to God what he deserves. That's it. People have different views on religion, some more correct, some less correct. But to have this childish uh, atheism coming from Christopher Hitchens who throws his hands up and says, la, 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 religion bad, religion, well, everybody. He's not throwing his hands up and saying religion bad and, and trying to avoid information about it. He's just point, he's poking holes and pointing out how you cannot simultaneously believe certain things. Yet here you are. Your contradictory ideas about how the world works. And says, la, 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 religion bad, religion, well, everybody engages in some kind of religion, right? They just... No. Some people just are not conscious of what they're doing, unfortunately, like Hitchens, who speaks very well, but who doesn't, who doesn't have very deep things to say. Wait, wait. He says everybody engages in religion. What's Christopher Hitchens' religion, then? What are you talking about? Nothing this dude just said made any sense at all. People are raving about GenuCell skincare. Oh, my God, dude. Come on. Just, no. I'm not giving your terrible sponsors any airtime, all right? And the fact that they're sponsors of yours in the first place tells me that I should avoid them at all costs. All right, let's start from here. YT. Some people I know who are atheists will say they wish they could believe it. That's me. I wish that I could believe in a very specific version of God, not this extremist nutcase that hates everybody who wants people dead and everything else. I don't want that, obviously. The, uh, what would you call like the evangelicals version of 
God, I don't, I, I don't want that at all. I would like to know that there's somewhere that I go when I check out. That's what I would like. Unfortunately, I just don't think that there is. I, I wish it were different. It just isn't. Former believers say they wish they could have their old faith back. They miss it. I don't understand this at all. I think it's, a, it's, it's an excellent thing that there's no reason to believe in the absurd propositions I just uh, admittedly rather briefly rehearsed to you. Um, the main reason for this, I think, is that it is a totalitarian belief. Absolutely. God is the final authority on everything, and it controls every part of your life in totality. Totalitarianism. It is the wish to be a slave. It is the desire that there be an unalterable, unchallengeable, tyrannical authority who can convict you of thought crime while you are asleep. Who can, can, who can subject you, who must indeed subject you, to a total surveillance around the clock every waking and sleeping minute of your life, I say of your life, before you're born and... Yeah, that's true. Subject you to 24-hour surveillance. I'll tell you, man, that surveillance really freaked my sister out when she was uh, 12. My mom caught her changing under the kitchen table, changing clothes to hide from jehovah to hide from god really she didn't want she thought jehovah was doing a little peep show action like how messed up is it to convince a kid so thoroughly of that really it's so sad so thoroughly that she will hide under a table when she changes that's wrong even worse than where the real fun begins after your death <laughs> a celestial north korea That's what it is, right? Who wants this to be true? Who but a slave desires such a ghastly fate? I certainly don't, but that's not my canonical understanding of the Bible that's based on, like, scholarship. If I had to communicate what I believe is going to happen, you know, after you die, based on the historical understanding of the Bible and of Judaism and, and everything else. I think that my canonical understanding right now, that may change with time, but right now, I think that my understanding is God will read your heart condition and determine if you are a good person or a bad person. And good people will go to heaven, bad will just go nowhere. They'll just, like, die, and that that's it. End of consciousness. That's my understanding right now. Again, that could change as I learn more about the historicity of all of this stuff, but, yeah, there's not... I mean, that's a fine... I, I have no problem with that, if that's really what it is. So Hitchens says it's slavery to serve God, is that's it? That's correct. Yes, it is. In fact, the Bible even says that it's slavery. You're a slave to God. You're supposed to enslave yourself to God, right? Because I'm more persuaded by what Christ says in the Gospels, which is the man who sins is a slave to sin. Right. So you, you it says you can't slave to two masters either you will slave for for or either you'll love the one and hate the other or despise the one and love the other or whatever and so you have to be a slave to god rather than to you know money or whatever other thing i mean that's a weird bizarre warped way to view it but the core of the message is god wants you as his slave anyone who's ever suffered from an addiction knows this you, you begin using drugs, let's say, or booze or something. Sure. I, I used uh, heroin for a couple of years. I went to school for substance abuse counseling. I know a lot about this subject. All right, go on. You begin indulging in this vice because you think it's an expression of your freedom. I'm free. No one can tell me what to do, man. I'm... No, that's not why that happens. I'm just going to do what I want to do. Actually, it was an attempt to escape the horrific shit, the chilling shit that I went through when I was little. I had no way to process the fact that the people that I trusted in my life to take care of me threw me under a bus because they could, not because they needed to, not because they were in a tough position, because they wanted to.
because they enjoyed it seemingly. That is why many people use drugs because they're struggling with this inner problem that they, they don't know how to process and they're trying to use it as a coping mechanism. That's not always the case. Sometimes people just use drugs because they enjoy them and they keep using them and using them and using them. And here's a little fun fact people don't like to tell you, you know, in those just say no or dare programs at school, drugs are good. They're extremely good. They're incredible, as a matter of fact. That's the problem. They are so good that you can't just use it once. And once you take it that first time and realize, recognize just how good it is, it's over. You will never see that drug the same way. You will always desire it. You'll be walk like f with me. Sometimes I'm walking in my little apartment complex. I have a little package room, you know. I'm walking down the hallway, going to the package room. The package room's right next to um, like a storage room where they keep like air conditioners that they can use to replace stuff, old drywall that they can repair holes with or whatever. And as I walk past that room to get to the package room, I smell the drywall. And weirdly, the drywall smells exactly like Coke, like uncanny resemblance between the smell of Coke and drywall. Somebody who's never done Coke will never have that. They'll never deal with that struggle. Drugs are too good. You cannot stop once you start. There's a very small subset of the population called chippers who are capable of picking up a drug that's extremely powerful and putting it down just like that, and they're fine. You know, casual recreational heroin users. It's like 0.01% of the population or something, and studies are being done on these people to understand the link between the brain and addiction and stuff, but... It's such an uncommon thing for somebody to be able to do a drug and not fall deeply into addiction that it's actually being studied by psychologists. People who don't fall headfirst into addiction after doing a drug once are being studied by psychologists. That should tell you something. It's not because of vices or freedom or whatever. I want to be free, so I'm going to do this. It's not about that. He has no clue what he's talking about here but okay go on you begin indulging in this vice because you think it's an expression of your freedom i'm f no. free no one can tell me what to do man i'm just going to do what i want to do but then the more you do it the more you feel impelled to do it the harder it is to stop doing it and then you become a slave mm, yeah okay i guess i agree with that this is why lord acton points out that freedom is not the ability to do whatever we want whenever we want to do it, but freedom is the right to do what we ought to do. Uh, okay, I don't understand what that meant, but let me just lay this one on you. Freedom is the ability to do what you want to do, but it must necessarily come with the understanding that there's a responsibility behind that freedom. Freedom comes with responsibility. You are like you're free to have a gun that's a freedom you have a responsibility to not use that gun to do something psychotic now i i, I find it so interesting that this guy seems to be arguing against freedom right now right freedom and responsibility go hand in hand now we happen to know that people who have way 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 too much freedom don't show any kind of responsibility for it. Like, for example, with guns, we need to show people that you need to be responsible with guns before we allow them to have one. They should prove to us that they know how to be responsible with them. And we should, as a society, be able to tell. We should go through licensing programs and training programs and make sure that they understand that it's important to keep it locked in a safe at all times, no matter what, and safe from everybody. And it's never to be used for home defense. You shouldn't be you, you shouldn't be shooting things that could go through walls and injure somebody on the other side. A gun is like literally the worst thing you could have for home defense. Baseball bat with a sock on the end is pretty good. 
I guess a shotgun with birdshot is so-so. Non-lethal rounds, i.e. rubber bullets, would be okay. Or less lethal rounds, technically. Those would be, they, those would be okay. Shouldn't be using a handgun to shoot in the middle of the night in the dark at some unknown target. That is like the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. The point is, people shouldn't be given freedom that has a serious risk of taking other people's freedoms away. They shouldn't be using those freedoms unless we know for a fact that they know how to use those freedoms safely and that they understand the responsibility that comes along with it. But freedom is the right to do what we ought to do. It's true. God asks you to submit yourself to him, to to uh, conform your will to his will. Right. So he asks you to be a slave. There you go. He's just saying, yes, uh, God wants you to be a slave to him. OK, go on. But that isn't slavery. That's freedom. No, it's slavery. They specifically use the term slavery in the Bible. It's slavery. As Christ says, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, wait. Yoke is easy, burden is light. So, I mean, he's using slave language there, isn't he? Don't slaves use yokes and have burdens to carry? <laughs> like, what? You're literally, like, you are dismantling your own belief system right now. What the hell is happening? Really? The alternative is a perverted, false form of freedom. Oh, so, I mean, yeah, it's slavery, but what's the alternative? Um, a perverted form of slavery, okay. False form of liberty, which is really license, that makes you a slave, and a slave to a much harsher master than God, who loves you. It makes you a slave to the devil, who wants to consume you. And who okay, this is just absurd. Often does when we when we refuse God's grace. Okay, next one. Not the sharpest crayon in the box, is he? You know what? I'll let Greg Locke say it for us. I don't like insulting people, so I will let somebody who is on this guy's side lay it down and 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 make it clear for us what's going on with Michael Knowles. I'm dumber than a box of rocks in a lot of areas. Facebook just makes people think I'm smart. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate your contribution to the conversation. It was the fate of many, many uh, Jewish people in Europe to have to wonder to whom they could turn um, in their time of extremity. And I'll tell you the place they didn't turn, which was the, to the churches that had made the official concordat with Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. The churches that had told their parties to vote for him in the, in the Reichstag the church that had told, especially the Catholic Church, that had told its, its bishops to celebrate Adolf Hitler's birth day every year from the pulpit, which they did till April 1945. Absolutely. And you know when Hitler's birthday was? April 20th. It was 420. How sad is that? Another fantastic holiday ruined by that <laughs> head. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, th that's absolutely correct. You know, th the church stood behind Hitler. In large part. Now, the Catholic Church stood behind him for a while, but eventually they got into it with each other and, they, you know, they didn't get along anymore and battled each other heavily and blah, blah, blah. But middle, 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 Hitler had it out with the, the Catholic Church. But yeah, absolutely. Hitler used the church to his advantage, without a doubt. Catholic Church that told its, its bishops to celebrate Adolf Hitler's birth day every year from the pulpit which they did till april 1945 this is so profoundly uh, dishonest no it's accurate actually but okay which the nazi party based itself which uh, in many cases violated the seal of the confessional to turn over resistors um and in all cases turned over the birth records of the parishes of uh, bavaria and the rest of germany so that the nuremberg laws could be enforced and everyone with even a particle of jewish blood could be identified set aside for deportation and persecution anyone who doesn't know this doesn't know anything about it oh my goodness that, it's so so profoundly dishonest was what's dishonest about it you're going to tell us or you're just going to keep saying it's dishonest it's dishonest tell me what's dishonest about this what, like what he's lying out for us here. Excommunicated or threatened with excommunication by the church for taking part in the final solution. Paul it's 100% accurate. Johnson, a Roman Catholic historian, estimates that 40 to 50% of the Waffen SS were confessing, communicating Roman Catholics. Not one of them was ever threatened with the smallest punishment for what they did or were doing. 
Wow, just amazingly dishonest on the history of, of the church. and uh, Please, f- set me straight, Michael. Tell me what was wrong with that. I want to know. The Second World War, amazingly dishonest. It's true. Pope Pius XII, uh, to my knowledge, never excommunicated Hitler. Hitler was not a, a practicing Catholic. Uh, he, mm, yeah, he had it out with the Catholic Church eventually, so I, I guess that's fair enough to say. He did, however, try to kill Hitler. <laughs> Pius XII worked quite closely, actually, with the, the German resistance against Hitler. Not until later. That wasn't until way, way, way into the war. Up until, um, like, 1940-something. I don't remember when they... There was a letter that was passed around every Catholic church. It was supposed to be read on the same Sunday across the world, and including in Germany. And uh, that was officially when the Catholic uprising, if you will, took place. It was, it was that moment. And Hitler like raided Catholic dioceses and took all their stuff and everything. Because they didn't support him anymore, because he was like coming after the Catholic Church, because it was a threat to his power base. Ultimately, it was all about power for Hitler. Uh, but he did use the church to his advantage when he could, and he used other churches, not just the Catholic one, to um, control people. So yeah, I did a bunch of research into this subject not too long ago. He uh, would give the the Brits tips. He was a, a go-between between the German resistance and the Allies. He had a spy trying to kill. Yeah, don't don't believe a word out of this guy's mouth. Okay, he lies for a living. I, I'm super suspect of everything that he says. Well, Hitler, Joseph Mueller, a Catholic priest, Pope Pius XII personally saved at least fifteen thousand Jews. Uh, worked around Rome. But elsewhere as well. Uh, there were also some, I don't know, again, I don't know if that's even true, be suspicious, but there were also Catholic priests that were pretty high up in the Vatican and, and other areas, other like districts or whatever. There were some Catholic uh, leaders that were forging birth certificates and, uh, you know, passports and documentation for Nazi soldiers that were you know, trying to get out of the country and and go to like Argentina or Chile or wherever to get safe from prosecution in Nuremberg trials. So, yeah, not not fantastic. I mean, the Catholic priests were helping the Nazis, and that was not the first time either. Castel Gandolfo, which is the, the papal retreat, housed thousands of Jews during World War II to protect them from the Nazis. The church used so many means at her disposal to keep Jews away from the Nazi persecution. Jewish historians estimate some 860,000 Jews were saved by the actions of the Catholic Church during World War II. The Catholic Church, which was a a victim of Hitler and saw herself as a victim of Hitler. Eventually, the Catholic Church was a victim of Hitler. It took time, but it got there eventually. Uh, The chief rabbi of Jerusalem thanked Pius XII for his efforts. So it's just, this is just a complete fable coming from Hitchens. Or, or what he does, I guess this would be the, the way that he, he tries to be uh, not a total liar about this. He'll say, well, you know, there was some priest who was really bad, or oh, there was some bishop who was really, really bad. Okay, but look at the actions of the church, all the way up to the head of the church and the vicar of Christ. 860,000 Jews saved, goodness gracious me. I, I mean, at least... Uh, again, don't trust his numbers. And the, the other arguments that Christopher Hitchens makes, they're extremely shallow, but they're, they're trying in some way to grapple with some question of morality. But there, Hitchens just has to totally ignore history. No, simply false. Let me tell you, let me give you a perfect example of what really went down, or a perfect analogy of what really went down, okay? In 1930-something, I believe, it was leading into the war. So 1932, Hitler really starts persecuting Jews terribly. Like the Jews were the underclass in Germany and honestly all over the world. Leading up to that point, the Jews were the underclass. They were mistreated by everybody. In every society, there's some group of people that is despised and mistreated and effectively second-class citizens in every society. And in Germany, hell, in Europe in the 30s, it was the Jews. They were the 
oppressed, despised minority group. And it took Hitler a while, say, um, I don't know, 10, 15 years to work up to the point that he finally arrived, but eventually got to the point where he had convinced people to absolutely despise Jews to the point that he they were willing to kill them. And he declared a Jew hunt in um, 1937, I think. It was 1937. Somewhere in there. 37, 38, 39. A Jew hunt. Anybody that saw a Jewish person pull the trigger. Uh, soldiers are supposed to go around and, and, and search them out and do something about it, basically. And uh, he realized, Hitler did, that there were so many people around in his army that had a problem with with killing somebody even i mean they could be the most diehard supporter of the cause believe it to the bottom of their hearts and it's still not easy to murder somebody it, it's just not you're not supposed to do that as a human being you're not supposed to kill another human and it was really messing some people up it was messing up their heads so Hitler realizes this during the Jew hunt, and he says, okay, well, let's industrialize it then. Pick out the soldiers that, are, that have the, the least issue with doing this, and we'll put them in these camps and just shuttle the Jews to these camps, and we'll have the, the soldiers who are most capable of, of dealing with this death and destruction, we'll have them lead it and, you know, release the gas and everything else. And that's what he did. Leading up to that point, back to what I was saying with Michael Knowles, leading up to that point, Jehovah's Witnesses, like before it got there, Jehovah's Witnesses were led by a guy named Charles Taze, I'm sorry, not Charles Taze Russell, that was the founder, led by Joseph Rutherford, who did a hostile takeover of the religion. After Charles Taze Russell, the founder, died, Joseph Rutherford took everything over and was ruthless in the things that he said and did. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses were mistreated in the war. As a matter of fact, they were targeted and they were put into death camps as well as um, political prisoners and stuff. Like political prisoners had red triangles. Jews had gold stars. Jehovah's Witnesses had purple triangles. Give you a little context there. Uh, and so what did Joseph Rutherford do? He wrote a letter to Hitler saying how much he supported the cause of getting rid of the Jews. The Jews were evil. They were not God's chosen people. He didn't want them around anymore. And he, he hoped that he could work with Hitler to accomplish the goal of getting rid of the Jews. That's the letter that Joseph Rutherford sent to Hitler, basically. When that didn't work, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses became victims of the Holocaust as well, and they latched on to that. That's kind of how I view the Catholic Church's interaction with Hitler. The Catholic Church started out trying to work with Hitler, and when it didn't really work out because they realized that the dude was only out for power and he was going to be the only person in power and they were going to have zero power, when they realized that they kind of you know, they gave up on it. That's my interpretation of the situation. And I, you know, I've gotten that interpretation from a number of historical sources. Uh, if anybody has anything to add about the subject below, please let me know. I, it's a complicated subject. Step back so you have more uh, context here. Grapple with some question of morality. But there, Hitchens just has to totally ignore history, whether it's through ignorance or whether it's just through his deep hatred of God, his apparent... Like he's not ignoring history. He's actually representing it exact, uh, as, as far as I could tell, exactly what it was. Hatred of God. I'm not sure exactly what it is. So uh, revisiting these things, it makes me ashamed of myself that I, that I fell for these, these arguments. The proof of the pudding is in the tasting on, on a lot of these questions as well. And so you, you can see that, that the arguments aren't very good and you can go back and read uh, theological sources or mm, Yeah, well, please, yes, go back, read theological sources. That would be great. If you read theological sources, it's a fantastic way to come to actual truth about the situation. This guy doesn't want you really understanding the theological 
meaning, uh, the scholarly distinctions and information about these subjects. If you read the scholarly articles about all of this stuff, it will destroy Michael Knowles' understanding of everything. Philosophical sources or question, you know, texts on ethics and history, I guess, in the case of his last... So here's his argument, ultimately. The argument that he's providing for us. These arguments are really bad. That's what he. That's his argument. These arguments are really bad. How? You're here to translate in what way they are bad. Please inform me. Not only is he saying simply these arguments are really bad, but he says go research it yourself. What? What are you doing? Why are you here? I thought you were supposed to tell us why these arguments were bad and in what way and in what the theological and historical context to all this stuff was. What happened to all that? Why are you not providing us with the information that I thought you were here to give us? This dude is just terrible, seriously. But ultimately the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. Does Chris Hitchens look like a guy who was flourishing? Look like a guy who was happy? Well, I, he had cancer for what it's worth. And look, I mean, I don't know about this picture here, but he looks like he's just enjoying himself. So yeah. Happy, who was at peace who was comfortable. He, he, they're showing pictures of when he had cancer. Are you kidding me? Does it get more dirty than this? This is like propaganda through and through. This is just disgusting, man. Well, in virtue, is that the sort of behavior you would want to model your life after? Is that the kind of guy where you say, this guy has figured it out? I don't think so. It caused 10 years of confusion for me, but glad I got out. Not everybody is quite so lucky to escape from the misery-inducing delusions of atheism. Okay, I'm Michael Knowles. Misery-inducing delusions? I mean, I'm an atheist, and I, I'm i not miserable. I'm perfectly happy. Again, I wish that I could believe this stuff, but after looking at the scholarly information behind the Bible and how it came to be and, and the context behind it and everything, I can't buy a single thing out of this dude's mouth. He has no clue what he's talking about. Again, you can be a Christian and understand the scholarly understandings of the the origins of the Bible and the context behind it and everything. You can be both scholarly understanding and Christian simultaneously. You just can't be a fundamentalist Christian and have a, a scholarly understanding. That's all. And anyway, let me know what you think about this in the comments. This dude is absolutely terrible, honestly.